It's hard to not feel invincible when you wear these colours. I'll be honest with you. Look at that blue and gold. And especially when you're coming in against that, uh, that old uh, dirty old red. Ah, it's blue and gold all the way. Well, it's definitely going to be blue and gold for you anyway, because it's close to your heart. And I know, um, I know your passion against Cork is fairly strong as well, but Jesus, some rivalry down through the years, even just researching it, the amount of... Just the amount of crack that's happened between the two of them and the the hatred, uh, there's some great yarns, yeah. Yeah, actually, now that, now that you say it, I'll play a little uh, quote um, from Tomás Mulcahy. I did an interview with him not too long ago on our game that I, and this is what he had to say. So the rivalry was, was just incredible. Yeah, we, did we hit Tipperary? We did. And did I hit Tipperary? Yes, I did. And I'm sure if you ask them, they'd probably, dis- probably say the same thing. But... <laughs> He just he hasn't spared. I mean, that's what it was. I mean, the idea, especially when it was knockout hurling, and you had one chance for the whole year to beat a team. You know, Cork bet the hay is saved. That's a good year. I mean, there was so much in it. Yeah, and they played each other every year. And just going back through it, it's like it's a different story every year. There's a different subplot, a different narrative. That's before the match even starts, and then during the match. All sorts of different scenarios going on between ball tampering and all sorts of different things going on. Yeah, but it's it's one of the, it's it's the great rivalry, realistically, great monster rivals. It was the most common monster pairing. They've you know I think they've ninety six monster titles between the two of them. Uh, they played each other every year, and it just gave us something different and something that you know things that we'll never forget, quotes that we'll never forget, and events that we'll never forget. Absolutely. Now, if you want to get these jerseys, go to orgleretro.com, put in our game as the promo code, and you'll get 15% off. So, there was a couple of, like, there's so many good quotes, like you were saying over the years, but one, a couple that stood out to me that I thought would tee up this rivalry nicely were Kevin Cashman. He said in the Munster uh, final program in 1991, to play Tipperary is something outsiders will never understand nor experience. The tremor in the blood that simple phrases, that simple phrase brings on. Titles and trophies matters, and all stars matter just a little. But where Cork stand vis a vis Tipperary is the only measure that really matters. And then another one, during the 1950 Munster final against Cork in Killarney, the rebel supporters tried to disorientate Tipperary keeper Tony Redden by throwing a coat over his head. <laughs> and as, he's, as he once said, Cork are never beaten until you're putting your clothes on in the dressing room afterwards. So, amen to that. Legendary stuff, yeah, legendary stuff. Imagine that, like having to pretend that he was a priest to get out of the grounds. That, but like, and like, if you said that now, people might think, oh, that's dangerous or whatever. But that was the that was the crack back then, and that was the devilment of it all as well. Do you know those type of things going on? That that just lends itself to you know all these great stories in history. It it wouldn't happen now, and you're not going to get those type of stories now because it's probably a lot more sanitized. But those are the stories that we'll be talking about forever more. Absolutely. I was looking at the first ever clash between the teams, as I was saying to you there, and we were, we're scant on details because it was 1888, but Tipperary won that game 2-2 to 0 down in Buttevant. So that was in May 1888. Two months later, there was a replay, and Cork won by a walkover. But this was the era of like fans on the field hooking players, uh, rows, walks off the field, you know, people would take the hump, basically. But there are so many great clashes. Is there one in particular that you want to start off on? Uh, no, I know you want to talk about the about the 1960 Munster final, but I might just go to the 1961 uh, Munster final. So in the closing stage of the 1961 Munster final, two of the greats, Christy Ring and John Dial, became, became embroiled in a row in which Dial's teammate Tom Malachny was struck. Ring was singled out as the culprit in the media, which enraged the Cork County Board, who threatened to sue RTE and a national newspaper. Journalists were barred from the press box and Doyle later revealed Ring had cracked him, cracked his chin. You know, these are the, the great kind of stories. And even Gerald McCarthy said about the time, about the, the rivalry in the 1960s, he said, it wasn't that Tipperary were beating Cork on a regular basis, but sewing it into them each time. Uh, McCarthy uh, recounted, what surprised me was it showed how calculating they were, as in Tipperary. They weren't content just to beat Cork, they hammered them to make the game the following year that bit easier, almost like Kilkenny were doing in the noughties as well. But just, yeah, like, imagine, like, uh, did, like Sue and RTE and journalists not being let in the press box, you know, it just, it was, uh, they had a cause anyway. It's fair to say they had a cause after the 61 final. Yeah, it meant so much. 1960, though, prior to the game, uh, Christy Ring roused his players, you know, kind of colleagues with a speech and it was fairly colourful language. And the priest sort of said to him, hey, 
Christy. I mean, the language is a small bit uh, tasty. And um, he said, my dear Christy, I'm sure you never read that in the New Te Testament. And uh, Christy replies, the men who wrote the New Testament never had to play Tipperary. So, um, any other game in particular that you want to focus on? Uh, no, just the, the the donkeys don't win derbies is one of the great, like one of the great lines ever said uh, by any manager. Do you know, I'll, I'll never forget one time uh, I was down in the bookies before Cheltenham one year and I, I mentioned a horse that I, to one of my friends, thought he had a chance of winning the champion hurdle even though he was 33 to 1 and he just turned around to me and said, donkeys don't win derbies like that and the horse ended up winning after. It was typical though, um, Babs gave Babs gave Cork a cause that time. It gave them any if they needed any motivation. Uh, they definitely didn't need any more after that. And it, there's a running team throughout the Cork Tipperary rivalry, and Babs Keaton is definitely a running team throughout it. Yeah, no, he did get a win, and it was Tip's first win over Cork in 16 years in 2007. So it is. This is probably a, a very forgettable clash. What a fair game on a Saturday evening, I think. Yeah, it was in Thurles, and it's the, the lowest attendance ever for a Tipperary Cork game. It was only something like 12,000. It was a pretty good game, but it was two, this was the year of the Semplegate with Cork. They were a poor enough team that year, and Tipperary were, I mean, they were soon going to get knocked out. But they were on a great little run of playing something like six times in seven weeks. And ended up losing to Wexford in the quarter final, but that was a good win for for Tipperary, and it showed you that there were players there, and obviously just Babs wasn't getting quite enough out of them. Um, another thing that kind of another trend is like this whole idea that one team has a game won. So in 1984, again, Tomas Mulcahy talked about this that uh, Tipperary were winning, and it was going to be their first win over Cork in a long time. Obviously, no All Ireland since '71, and this was very much the doldrums. But Tip were ahead. Cork fans ended up leaving the ground. They were off on their on the train down home with the tail between the legs, not realizing that in the meantime they'd scored two late goals and won the game. And and they didn't find out till they were back in Cork, which is which is kind of gas stuff when you think about it now and how instantaneously you know the results. But I had almost a similar experience in two thousand and five. I was down in Parky Cueve, tip were down by something like nine points at half time. Paul Kelly gave an exhibition, something like seven points from play. But I left with a couple of minutes to go. Then I could hear a goal being scored in the background, so I went running to try and get back in. So by the time I went back in, the game was over. But Tipperary, I think, missed a late chance to equalise and all, so I know what that feels like. Yeah, I'm, del I'm delighted now. I'm delighted, like, at least you showed your true colours and you put and you put, you put it out there. This is why, even even if a team was up 15 points going into injury time, I will never leave a game early, because it was literally brought up on my father saying... Uh, about Kerry boys leaving the 1982 football final early and you know dancing around dancing around Dublin until they, they finally realised that Derby was after getting the goal and funnily enough uh, we were selling tickets for a, a bird draw over in O'Connor Park Kilkenny and Galway uh, drew 2014 Galway were down by 9 points and we started hearing all this noise and people running back to the stadium. And we left about 10 minutes to go because we had to go back for training. And Galway were after snatching a draw. And it, you, should, you can never leave. And you can definitely never leave a tip Cork game early. Have you had to deal with that, with that traffic coming out of Cork? Or even getting away from the stadium, getting the whole way back up to the train station? You want to get out early, especially if you think the team is beaten. Now, I know plenty of people are going to be on my side and many more will hammer me for it. So, you know, there are some people who understand and some won't. I gladly would sit in traffic for four hours if you're after if you're after winning, and I gladly sit in traffic for four hours to to have seen the last bit of action and not be wondering, oh Jesus, am I after missing one of the greatest moments in GA history? Okay, fine, we'll move on from that. I think definitely the famine is over. Nineteen eighty-seven, you can't ignore that. That was glorious. Tip's first time in sixteen years, and. That was an amazing one. It's probably been talked about so much that I'd be happy to move on a little bit to the 19... There's one second again, just on the 87 one, uh, something that's not talked about that much. Gerald Cunningham is obviously renowned for his like boom and puck outs. We were watching the 1990 All-Ireland final there recently. He was hurt in the year in 1986, you know that? That's right, yeah, that's right, yeah. One of the few goalies to have gotten it. But his puck outs were landing down to 21. So the great Babs, the great mind that is Babs, doused a load of slitters in in wet wa in water and basically left them dripping in wet water and they got them into they got them into Cunningham for a couple of his puck outs and they ended up balls ended up with the umpires. So th he basically like derailed his long puck out. So it was dropping maybe twenty or thirty yards less. 
Jeez, the, and they put it in wet water now. Jeez, that's that's wet a little water, extra. Yeah, yeah, wet water as opposed to dry water. <laughs> you clown. Now we'll jump on a couple of more years to 1991. Um, this is another game that went to a replay and Pat Fox enjoyed the distinction of scoring the equaliser in two games, in both games. So his late free at Semple ended up sending the game to a replay and Tip won, their, won then down in Killarney 422 to 122. And actually he had fired over a, li- a late um, leveler once more. But actually, was that three games? I'm not 100% sure. No way. Anyway, whatever it was, Aidan Ryan scored an unbelievable goal that day. And obviously, Aidan Ryan from the same parish as myself, he'd have been the closest thing that I had to Hurling Hero growing up, the kind of shock of blonde hair. Anyone who doesn't know him, I mean, look up Aidan Ryan goal 1991 against Cork. So this was a situation where he got two blockdowns gathered the ball, blasted into the net, and the crowd exploded onto the field. Like, the Tipperary fans didn't care that the game was still ongoing. They decided we had won this thing, and, like, the typical yahoos that we are, we're going to storm the pitch. But I'll just give you some of the quotes from that. Um, so, Aidan Ryan, I did a piece with him afterwards, and he says, I just remember Declan Ryan hitting it into open space, and I was like a savage because I had to run so far just to put a challenge in on Sean O'Gorman. Then Michael Ryan, the, the soon-to-be tip, or the Tipperary manager later down the line, says... My biggest memory is that the goal would be disallowed because the crowd had charged onto the field. That was my immediate fear. Tip fans were in the way of Cork players trying to play the ball out and it was entirely wrong. It was mad stuff, bananas, but a great memory. And then Aidan Ryan uh, adds, By the time the ball struck the net, I had just enough energy to get away. It was a struggle to get away, but we didn't give a rat's ass because we knew, barring an absolute de- disaster, we were going to win one of the best monster finals you could be involved in. We'd come from an impossible position and suddenly you were in the driving position and the Cork players probably didn't know what happened. And we probably didn't either. I remember watching on the television, maybe on Know Your Sport, but you had to guess what happens next. They showed that particular footage and what happened is some guys uh, gets wheeled out onto the middle of the pit park on a wheelchair and there's a fella pushing him along and they did a little wheelie on the middle of the pitch and went back off the side of the pitch. It was their attempt at a pitch invasion with a wheelchair. I saw the footage. It was priceless. That's some stuff. Oh, it's absolutely unbelievable. I've watched, I've seen the goal several times, but I just watched it before we started. If you were to, you know, everyone would talk about, you know, scoring the goal from 50 yards, great goal or whatever. If you were to, in your head, think, what is the dream goal? This is the dream goal. Aidan Ryan's not even in the picture when Sean O'Gorman throws up the ball. He comes in for no, or blocks him down, and blocks down a really great corner back who's very, very tidy. Manages to get another, like, a block or a flick in, and then finishes it off beautifully. And as he says himself, he was absolutely goose by the time he tried to get back out the pitch. Like, you just see the hands in the air, but, ah, like, that stuff with the, the, with the wheelie in the wheelchair and all like that, that's, like, you, you can't write that. That's ah, absolute gold. There was a great quote then from, from was it Brian Corcoran's autobiography the following year that you had? Yeah, you might just you might just show your jersey a bit more just to accentuate the point here. So they played uh, they played in nineteen ninety two. And uh, in Brian Corkin's autobiography, every single ball, he tells how Ken O'Brien motivated them before the final. So placing a Cork and a Tipperary jersey at the top of a room in Jury's Hotel, he asked the players what was the difference. I'll tell you the difference, he said. See that one. That's the blood and bandages of Cork. See the other one. And there's a big yellow streak running through it. So, like, it's just, like, that stuff... When you're in a when you're in a dressing room, like you'd be literally like like you'd be just like oh, you'd be spitting fire and just absolutely mad or run out through a wall after something like that. Will you go away with that? That is gold. That is that is premier stuff right there. Go away with your yellow. Um, let's move on to the next one, which was yeah, two thousand. It was only on the TV during the week, and it was agricultural stuff. I'll be honest with you. Uh, Cork were a bit better at using the ball and ultimately pulled away at the end. But Tommy Dunn, he scored one great goal. Then he moved into full forward towards the end when Tipperary were looking for goals, and he got a ball. I can't remember who gave it to him, but he just turned, blasted the blindly blasted it to the top corner from twenty yards out. Great stuff altogether. Joe Dean really, really good in that game. Um, the two thousand and five monster final. I've mentioned it already, but you you had something from it. Ah, yeah, it's just it goes back in with all this kind of ball tampering is is a common team uh, between the two of these. And in the 2005 Munster final, of course, um, uh, the Cork team actually hatched a plan to replace the ball um, should the opposition win a penalty. So Owen Kelly was notorious, had an unbelievable rattle of a ball, very, very hard save, 21 or a penalty. So Cork conceded a penalty, they distracted both the referee and Tipperary to get a dud ball into play. It was kind of rolled onto the pitch, it just kind of appeared there. 
uh, Donald Cusack said in his autobiography, so that it would just appear to be lying on the grass to be picked up. There was not an obvious, it would just appear there. The word tip was written on the ball too. Um, it was ingenious, but kind of it was so sneaky. It was a big, dirty, heavy ball. The, the rims were kind of filed down on it. It was there was no way it was going to move through the air like a normal ball would. And just even uh, Cusack says here that we actually practiced it that if there was a penalty given, one of us would cause a diversion, give out to the ref, and roll in another ball, strike the other one away. I remember looking at Owen Kelly from Tip who took the penalty, thinking that the ball is not going to go as hard as you think it will go. And Owen has said it himself since. And yeah, we saved the penalty. Now he didn't have a bad shot in fairness, but that one incident. Um, go back to Babs Keating, he says, uh, or whoever, or drying the slitters. But my argument was that until everyone is playing by these rules, I'm not playing by them. So it was kind of, uh, it was it was kind of up in the air. You could kind of get away with things like that, which again I love because maybe it's too hard to kind of get away with the sneaky underhand kind of things now. But I love that kind of stuff. Now uh, Cork went on to win the Munster final in 2006, also by a goal. But since then, Cork have won just two of 11 championship matches between the teams and there's been a single draw. And there's been some obviously brilliant games. We saw there a couple of years ago, Tip went nine points behind at half time. Rain came for the second half. Cork didn't have the steel for it. Tipperary came back and drew. And obviously the most recently won the All-Ireland. But a great game that definitely is worth talking about was that 2008 game when Owen Kelly scored the Rasper. Remember when he shrugged off Brian Murphy, turned and from the edge of the, was it the 14 or 21, hit the top corner. But that was Tipperary's first win in Parky Cueve since Jesus was a boy, I think. It was It was just, it had been so, so long. That So that was Liam Sheedy's first championship game. So that was absolutely huge. And I remember Ryan O'Dwyer telling me a story when, where he had these sort of rugby tackling bags or something like that in the lead up to the game. And he had them dressed in Cork jerseys. So obviously the Tipperary savages were going nailing Cork boys as they did later that summer um, jump on then since two years later obviously Tipperary were, were starting to take over in this particular rivalry but in 2010 Tipperary just been in the All-Ireland final the year before gave a great performance the, obviously that was supposed to be a stepping stone to winning an All-Ireland the following year bam get hammered by 10 points down in Cork Zachy O'Halpine just took the game over uh, Patrick Horgan scored a couple of goals and that was supposed to, like that seemed like it was going to derail Tipperary. Now, obviously, turned it around, but that was that was a serious beating. That was a serious beating, and they actually played each other in the league that year. And Azaki went in full forward on Potty Matter, who was full back. I think it was it was the All Star full back in all nine. I think he was, and um, he caused them all sorts of damage, all sorts of trouble, just for about maybe ten or fifteen minutes. And then they switched him away from Potty Matter. They actually switched him off him so that Potty wouldn't get kind of acquainted with, you know, his style because he had an unusual style. Then he marked him that day. Uh, Izaki absolutely went to town. So so dangerous. It was almost kind of like seeing what, what Satanta would have done if, he, if he'd stayed around. But it must have absolutely sickened Cork that basically inadvertently they won Tipperary to All Ireland. They stopped the drive for five. Um, it's it, we're t- we talk about sliding doors in some other shows. Like that is one of the great sliding doors. If if Tipperary had just shown up as everybody expected them and won that game, would they have made the necessary changes that were needed to beat Kilkenny later on in the year? Probably not. So. Cork haven't won All Ireland uh, since 2005, but in fairness, they played a fair hand in the 2010 one. Yeah, I'll take that. Do you know that they actually haven't met in a Munster final since 2006? Isn't that quite incredible when you think that they've both picked up several titles? Yeah, it is mad, actually. Yeah, that's actually nuts in fairness. And even on that 2006 game, uh, Babs was at it again that day. He began the game behind the Cork goal at the town end in Turles. Uh, He wanted to disrupt uh, Donald Cusack's ball supply, believing Cork were ball tampering. He later accused them of gamesmanship and the pair became kind of involved in like a heated row and a shoving match. Like, uh, like I just love that stuff. Um, Like the stories of like managers being behind the goals and managers being around the field. Like it's grand them being kept in a little kind of confined area but like like what harm are they doing really I, I just love that sort of stuff you know like uh, Gerald Nan was behind the Clare goal or behind the tip goal at the end of 97 All-Ireland when Jamesy put over the pint he was standing behind the goal and then of course you have the famous one of Brian Cody falling to his knees in in all four when Wexford got the goal as well I love that I, I, give, I give them carte blanche to go wherever they want to go 
<laughs> um, so 2009 also, wasn't there was a bit of an incident between Webster and Don Lowe. Oh, there was, yeah, there was, yeah. So Webster lost his hurl, Michal Webster, the big tower in full forward, and uh, seeing it on the ground, Don Lacusick stood on one half of it and pulled the top of it towards him, snapped his hurl, and as he wrote in his book then, um, then I held it up as if it had been broken all along, and I just found it lying there. So he's holding the hurl up like that, like he's innocent almost, and like Michal Webster, somebody get him a hurl, and he after breaking the hurl, basically. We we looked at any there's there's so many different players that we could kind of pit against each other because you know we do this at every Orga show where we talk about a couple of great characters and who would you rather have and like you know there's Seamus Callan and Patrick Horgan for example you know Paddy Maher and Sean Ogilvy I mean there there are a million and one different ones you could go for and I mean like you you mentioned Doyle and Ring you know that'd be another perfect one to pit against each other. But are there two more iconic figures that sum up this rivalry more than JBM and Nicky English? I know um, Dublin boy is always giving out about my wrestling references, but this is like Hollywood Hogan, Hulk Hogan against The Rock, WrestleMania 18. Icon versus Icon. As, as icons in their counties go, they don't get much bigger, realistically. They just don't get any bigger. Uh, what I think Nikki, like Nikki's achievements, absolutely unbelievable. Like you probably remember, you I'm for sure you would grew up on that kick goal in the 1987 final. It was unbelievable. Like ball over the top, his hurley gets knocked out of his hand <clears throat> as he's wrestling with his man. He's 20 yards out. He takes one little touch and bends it into the bottom corner from from the 14 or 21 or something like that. You just don't see that in her. No, you just don't see it anymore. It was just like, it was so cool. It was just so cool in a totally unfamiliar um, kind of position. That's why you should always train and coach players to be creative and like have them doing stuff like that down the hurling field. You know what I mean? It's not all about like mastering the pickup or the basic skills. You need to be able to do those things. I suppose it's the benefit of playing other sports as well. And if you're talking about like playing other sports, like JBM is one of the greatest, if not the greatest Jewel star to have ever played. And just go through his honours list here. It's it's actually just staggering, really. Club titles. So in Cork, he had three Cork senior football titles, seven Cork senior hurling titles, two Munster club football titles, three Munster club hurling titles, two All Ireland senior football club titles, and two All Ireland senior club hurling titles. And that's before you get to inter county. Two Munster medals in football, ten in hurling. One All Ireland in football, five in hurling. One league in football, two in hurling. Two All Stars in football, five in hurling. Like that's it, it. It's unbelievable, really. It's it's like you'll do you'll do well you'll do well. Anybody get close to that throughout club and county and throughout through hurling and football. It's it's a staggering list. Yeah, on the medals front, there are very few who are gonna who are going to live with Jimmy and obviously he's just iconic and even the hair and the you know six foot two eyes of blue all that kind of stuff but Nicky was obviously iconic too even that photographs you know the one where his nose is basically getting jarred by somebody's hurley but his honours list it's the Fitzgibbon Cup one i would kind of forgotten about this he'd won five in a row he has five Fitzgibbon Cup titles and obviously that can't be done anymore because there's a limit on the amount of years you can play but just to go through some of the rest of what he's won two All-Ireland titles so 89-91 and obviously Tipperary were in, in doldrums kind of either end of his career. Uh, Munster titles all the way from 87, 88, 89, 91 and 93. So he had a nice run there. A couple of leagues, All-Ireland under 21, Munster under 21, All-Ireland minor, Munster minor, six All-Stars, Hurler year 1989, Tip Hurling team of the century at left corner forward, Fitzgibbon Cup uh, team of the century, right corner forward. Obviously you mentioned that kick goal. Like man of the match in 1989, All-Ireland final, I think he scored half of Tips 424 that day. Just a glorious player that you just love watching him play. Like he's the sort of lad, a bit like DJ Carey, JBM, also, where you pay in to watch what this lad is going to do. Oh, 100%. Even like uh, my colleague in Independent, Martin Brehan, he did a, a best Tipperary players, best 20 players of the last 50 years, and Nicky was number one. Like, as you say, he was number one ahead of Son of God, Owen Kelly, number two. If you're ahead of Owen Kelly in anything, you're an absolute phenomenon, in all fairness. And JBM, JBM was up in the top two or three of the Cork list as well. That's what you're looking at. And even the fact that they were so iconic for their teams and for their counties. As you say, JBM was nearly like the kind of the George Best of 
of the Gaelic football in Harlem world at that time, you know, the kind of long hair, flamboyant, although he was a quiet character, he was flamboyant on the pitch. All He saved all his exuberance and flamboyance for the pitch. And then even you have the two of them that they went on, obviously both to be all Ireland winning managers as well, in or around the same time and would have met each other in a couple of games around then as well. Um, very, very hard to separate them. Um, obviously, it's funny, like, Nicky, Nicky's from football country as well. So maybe that's kind of why or you know, why he was able to even score that kind of soccer goal. And like, he wouldn't be, Latin Cullen wouldn't be, I don't know if anybody has played for Tip Hurlers from Latin Cullen since Nicky. I, I'd be struggling to say that they, that they have. But uh, he's just an unbelievable player. Okay. Yeah, I do know one panelist, all right, that was that was with them. I, I heard of him at the moment. Um, but he won an intermediate uh, county title with Latin Cullen, I believe. They're now Latin Gales. Um, so who are you going to pick? Are you taking JBM, are you? I'm taking JBM because I'm thinking of it from a county's point of view that I can have him full full forward, half forward for both the hurlers and the footballers. I'll 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 mind him and I'll make sure he's fit to play for both of them. Whereas I don't think Nicky Nicky adds an awful lot, an unbelievable amount. But I don't know if he'd be kicking football for Tip as long as as well as playing hurling. I'd say he definitely would. And the thing is, I'd say if Tipperary had a football team that was really competing. And it was one of those things where it's fifty-fifty to go to either team. I'd say that I, I would say they were definitely asking him to play back in the day. Now maybe didn't ask him too hard because they knew there's only one show in town. But he, he he was like he couldn't have not been a brilliant footballer. And to be to be fair, we should probably talk a little bit about the Cork Tip football rivalry. But then again, I think Cork have held a whip hand so often that it's hard to kind of truly balance it as a massive rivalry. Certainly in, in recent times, bar that one win for Tipperary a couple of years ago. Um, I would say, obviously JB, as um, John Myler referred to him in an interview with him this week, they call him JB. Unbelievable character. Uh, even watching back that 2000 uh, monster clash and they were having a smirk with each other on the sideline as it was getting to the last 10 minutes of the game, you know, a time when both of them stood up so many times for their county. I'd have to go with Nicky English because, with a, like, JBM, his final game, All-Ireland final in 1986, scores a goal and wins the All-Ireland. So, like, he's just got that perfect, even poetic finish. But for me, Nicky English has to be the number one because it's, how did it make you feel when you were watching those games back in the day? And no, no player kind of sums up this jersey, especially this version of the jersey, more than he did. So, like, brilliant player, but how many thrills did he give you as a young lad? It has to be Nicky English. It's funny you say that. Uh, Nicky, Nicky's, like, kick goal, I don't know if that'll ever be repeated. Jimmy Barry's uh, flicked goal in the air that the cam that it's that quick that the camera doesn't catch. I don't think that'll ever be repeated because that type of thing doesn't happen at inter-county hurling anymore. Yeah, I think we've it all said. We've it all I said. Boy, Jays, it's, it's some rivalry when you go through it. Uh, it would just leave you absolutely itching for the two of them to play each other in the Munster Championship this year. It mightn't be this year, but whenever it happens, the the history involved. Just imagine what the managers would be like, even in dressing room. Any time Tipper playing Cork or any time Cork are playing Tip, like there's never any motivation needed whatsoever. It's one of the great rivalries. Absolutely. And if you want to get these jerseys, go to orgaretro.com. 15% off if you put in the promo code, our game.